Good evening, everyone. And first evening. off, before I forget it, on behalf of Joseph, thank y'all all for being here tonight. <laughs> he, he just appreciates this crowd. <laughs> and uh, so does the Historical Society. Well, a lot of you know Joseph Hudson, who is our presenter tonight. Joseph is a lifelong resident of Northern Greenville County. His family, both the Hudsons and the High Towers, have ties to North Greenville County, to the upstate in general, so he has a long line of history there in his family. Joseph is a graduate of Traveler's Rest High School in 2003. He went to North Greenville University, attended there. His full-time job is he is music minister at Cleveland First Baptist Church up in Cleveland, South Carolina. Has a part-time job that he helps us at the house mortuary, and he is kind of our sound, computer, live stream, anything technical guru. <laughs> you know, he, he, we love it when he's there because I don't have to worry about it because I'm not a guru at anything technical. So, so let's see, I, meant to, I, I get sidetracked. So anyway, he is also, he's on the Historical Society board. He's a board member there. He is treasurer of a national Railroad Ania Collectors Association. And he also is a railroad historian. Joseph loves the railroad. He eats and sleeps it. He's my go-to guy for pictures, because I like railroad stuff too. But he can buy, I can find stuff and he can always find me a picture. This presentation that he's gonna do tonight is about 15 years worth of research. He has got pictures that you've never seen before and facts I'm sure that you've never seen before. So before I introduce him and welcome him up here, he will take questions at the end, but if you would, just wait till the end to ask those questions, okay? And he'll be happy to answer anything you have. So at this time, Joseph, come on, we look forward to it, brother. I appreciate it, Bo. I, uh, no. I, like Bo said, this is 15 years culmination of 15 years worth of research. Um, just a few little numbers. Um, as it goes for Greenville and Northern Railway only, I have over 526 pictures in my collection, uh, over 200 newspaper articles pertaining to the railroad, and more documents than I care to count. Um, so in the words of the great poet laureate Jerry Reed, We've got a long way to go and a short time to get there tonight. So we're going to jump right in. Greenville Northern Railway is right of the Swamp Rabbit. Now tonight you will not hear me refer to this as the Swamp Rabbit Railroad. Simply for the fact that the Swamp Rabbit Railroad was at Echo Valley Park. Um, you often won't hear me refer to it as the Swamp Rabbit either. Because the nickname the Swamp Rabbit came from people in Greenville that was used to poke fun at our little railroad. Because our little railroad didn't have a lot of money, couldn't do a lot of maintenance and stuff. So the tracks were not in the best shape back in the early days. And so Greenville people, in order to poke fun at our little railroad, named it the Swamp Rabbit, because it bounced, supposedly bounced along like a rabbit. <clears throat> but let's get started. Carolina Knoxville and Western Railway was the first railroad in our, in our little sector. Started in 1887, um, some Greenville businessmen, um, some other folks wanted to build a direct through route from uh, Port Royal, South Carolina and Charleston, the ports down there, and wanted a direct through route to East Tennessee and Western, and uh, West, or excuse me, East Tennessee and East Kentucky uh, to the coal fields. They wanted a direct route to take coal directly to those ports. So they came up with Carolina, Knoxville, Western, um, 1888, they built 15 miles of track from Greenville to Marietta. Um, this picture here is uh, what we believe to be the first trip to Marietta. It's probably a Helms Crossing. Um, this is the only known picture of a Carolina Knoxville and Western locomotive. And the name, see back then they named their locomotive. So this was, this locomotive's name was the Richard M. Humboldt. Um, and so, like I said, the railroad was very poor. They didn't have a whole lot of money. And north of Marietta, there was a big hill that they had to get through, hearts cut. And that proved to be a real problem for the railroad. Um, in fact, later on, they would go bankrupt trying to get through that hill. 
Um, so along the, along the right of way, we had the Spring Park Inn. Um, there was a station, there was a platform at the Spring Park Inn. Um, the railroad wanted to be able to drop customers off, passengers off at the Spring Park Inn. The only thing we know about the platform, it was 150 feet long, and that's it. That's all that we know. Um, hopefully at some point, once we get in the house and get things going along, uh, there's going to be a recreation of that platform out in front of the house. Um, we believe the platform to be approximately where the gazebo sits today. Um, you'll see in a later map the approximate location of that, so we believe it to be right there where the gazebo is. Um, also, on the property, they built a pavilion um, for the entertainment of people. Um, this, this area of, of the town was known as the lower station. The, deep, the platform, we believe, was called the lower station. And so they would drop people off for political meetings and dances and all sorts of crazy stuff, all sorts of parties and, and get-togethers. <clears throat> um, they also built a depot in Traveler's Rest in downtown. And at that point, that part of the town was called Athens. And uh, a lot of times this was referred to as the upper station. Um, today, you will not be able to find where that station was because it's in the middle of the highway. Um, that station was right across. You can kind of see in the background to the right over there. That is uh, what at that time was Blue Ridge Oil Company, Blue Ridge Cottonseed Oil Company. Um, so the depot is right across there. So when you go up, go up towards Marietta and you drive, drive in the right-hand lane it's heading up that way, you're driving right through the middle of the depot. <coughs> And this, this is the only known, and I keep saying only known because I know that there are other pictures out there. So if you know someone that has pictures of stuff, please let me know because I would love to see them. But this is the only known picture of the Travel Dress Depot when it was being built. Um, in the picture from the left to right are uh, Jim Wynn, Jasper Watson, and Dr. B.F. Goodlett, who owned a lot of the property in downtown. Uh, travel address at that point. Um, in 1896, uh, the Carolina Knoxville and Western goes bankrupt trying to get through Hart's Cut. Um, they just they went bankrupt trying to blow a hole through that hill. And uh, so, um, 1899, all the track from Greenville up to Marietta at that point was pulled up. This is one of a probably a dozen times in the history of the railroad that the rails were pulled up. Um, let's see. Okay, so there's there's a little uh, sandborn map. This is from 1920. It kind of shows the approximate location of the depot. Um, you can see it there with the yard and travel dress and the Blue Ridge Oil Company right there. That's now Sunrift. <coughs> so in 1899, the Charleston Western Carolina Railroad, which built a line from uh, Fort Royal up through uh, Columbia and Lawrence to Greenville, buys the right of way to the Carolina Knoxville Western. And they build a line from the downtown terminus where they came in um, on top of the right of way to uh, the Union Bleachery, which was down here on the Old Buncombe Road. Um, this thing's not working. Um, this is the downtown terminus of the, Carolina, of the uh, Charleston, Western Carolina. Um, it was at the corner of Matby and Falls Street um, where the Prisma Health Building is now located. Uh, the uh, Church Street Bridge uh, today runs kind of over the freight house back there in the back and across, across the uh, river down there. Uh, so in order, in order for the Charleston, West Carolina to reach uh, the, where the Carolina Knoxville and Western right of way, they had to build a line through downtown Greenville. And this was the line. This is right through where um, this picture was taken from uh, South Main Street, um, where the Swamp Rabbit Bridge is today. Uh, the Carolina, or yeah, the Carolina Knoxville Western built a uh, built a bridge across the river to service uh, Camperdown Mill. Um, but like I said, once they went bankrupt, they tore all that stuff out. So the Charleston, Western Carolina, had to build another bridge across to uh, reach the old CKW right away. Um, this is the line when they were tearing it up in the 90s um, after, after, the, uh, after the Seaboard Coastline abandoned uh, the line through downtown. 
And this is what it looks like there today. Um, that's the, the swamp rabbit bridge. I keep doing this. And here, because here's here's a plaque that's down there, and I'll, and I'll read you one part of it. And like Bo said, I'm a railroad historian. So facts are very important to me. I mean, I get that there's tourist stuff to attract tourists and make a great story, but historical facts are paramount to me. This plaque says, for 100 years, the Swamp Rabbit Railroad crossed the Reedy River at this site. That's false. <laughs> the Swamp Rabbit only crossed somewhere down there from 1887 to 19, 1896. Only a 91 year discrepancy. So what's 91 years among friends? <clears throat> I also like to play the game of what if. Um, in 1900, there was an article in the Greenwood Evening Index that detailed the Southern Railway's desire to complete the line um, from Union Bleachery across the mountain and into Hendersonville. Because at that point, they were having a lot of problems on Saluda. They, they just built Saluda. They're having a lot of problems with trains running away and crashing, killing a whole bunch of people. And so they were looking for a way to circumvent that route. Um, and in the article, it details that uh, if, they had, if they could build it up the old CKNW where they were planning to go, that they could do it cheaper and at a lower grade from Greenville to Hendersonville than they could rebuilding the Saluda route. <clears throat> and so the big what if, if, if they had completed this line, Traveler's Rest would have had trains like the Carolina Special stopping in the middle of town. We'd have great passenger trains stopping. We'd have freight trains such as the Belmont Coal Train coming through downtown Greenville, <laughs> running from Ando or running, excuse me, coming through downtown Traveler's Rest, running from Andover, Virginia to the Belmont power plant in Belmont, North Carolina. And even today, we may still have trains <laughs> running through TR. Uh, this picture was sent to me by a friend of mine that retired from Norfolk Southern. Uh, his name was Tommy Presnell. He was a, he was a great railroad historian like myself. Um, and we often discussed the big what if. And so Tommy sent me, a, sent me this picture one day. He said, we have trains in downtown TR now. Because he photoshopped one of his one of his trains that he was on. Photoshopped that that's crossing right in front of TR Oriental and uh, passing down through the little through the little shopping center there. It's a big what if. It never happened though. Um, in 1904, um, the people in the northern part of the county wanted rail service. They wanted their railroad back. And so a group came together and formed the Greenville and Knoxville Railroad in, uh, in late 1904. And it was formed to finish the line over the mountain because that was their main goal was to get over the mountain. Um, and so this locomotive here, um, this is the only known uh, picture of a Greenville and Knoxville Mark locomotive. Uh, that's from my collection. I found that photo in a gentleman's garage over in Taylor's. And, I, and I, I, as soon as I saw it, I knew what it was, and so I, was, I said, I want that picture. <laughs> you know, if I buy nothing else today, I want that picture. And so he sold it to me, and uh, this locomotive was, was built in December 12, 1912. Or, it was, excuse me, it was purchased by the Greenville and Knoxville on December 12, 1912. It was originally built in 1891 for the Lehigh Valley Railroad. And so you see here, uh, the Greenville and Knoxville finished the line into Marietta. Um, having stops at uh, Monaghan, which is down by the mill, White Oak, uh, Montague, Altamont, and other stops. <clears throat> and this was in 1907. Um, 1909, this is 1909 timetable schedule um, from the newspaper. They, they published these timetables in the newspaper to get passengers. They wanted people to ride the train. And so this, this is 1909, shows that the DNK had reached as far as Cleveland. Uh, W.H. Patterson, a businessman in Atlanta, was the, bit, was the president of the railroad, and their offices were in Atlanta. So their, their main headquarters was in Atlanta at this point. And, and that's going to come into effect here in a second. <coughs> um, all the stations on, on the Greenville and Knoxville, and later uh, Greenville Western, 
were not full depots. Uh, a lot of them were little flag stops. Uh, some just had platforms. There, some, some of them there was not anything there, but people knew to go there and they would flag the train down, and uh, they would get on by purchase a ticket and and travel north. Um, this picture is not on the Grandma Knoxville. This picture is from the Tallulah Falls Railroad down in Georgia, but that's just an example of what one of those little flag stop sheds may have looked like <clears throat> on the G and K. Um, also to note in this picture are the ties there at the uh, at the little flag stop. The railroad would pay farmers and local local people to cut ties for the railroad. And so what they would do is the farmers and folks would cut the ties and they would take them down to the flag stop or wherever and affix a little tag to it. And when the railroad came through, they would pick up the ties and they would pay the people with the tags affixed to their ties. So that's just an example. Um, Mabel, how many of you know Mabel Clark? Uh, that was at Soapstone Church. Um, she did a big fundraiser. Mabel's dad did this for the Greenville Northern in, in, in the early days. <clears throat> And so, in 1910, the GNK finally reaches River Falls. Um, this is, again, the only known picture of the depot up close at River Falls. Um, it was originally known as Potts Cove, but it was later changed to River Falls. Um, so when you see these pictures, you often kind of wonder what the railroad looked like in this location. Fortunately, in 1915, the, the next railroad that takes over did plat maps for the entire railroad. And so this is what the railroad looked like in River Falls. Um, they would come in from the, from the left side over here, that's from the south, and the depot is, is the middle picture, in little black dot in the middle. And so in order to turn the train around to go back to Greenville, they built what they called a Y. And so the train would pull forward and back through the, the north end of the Y, and then pull forward through the south leg and then back up and it was ready to head back south. Um, and you can see the end of track over here and shortly before the river um, over near, um, Margaret, what's the name of that road? Duckworth. Duckworth Road, thank you. Um, so this, uh, this is 1915 um, and it ends near the present day River, uh, river Falls Lodge, little dance hall up there. Um, like I said, I always want pictures of stuff. You can see it on a map, but you always want a picture of it. And I always wondered if there was ever, show, would ever show up a picture of the Y at River Falls. Facebook is a wonderful thing sometimes. <laughs> I'm a member of a, probably 100 railroad groups on Facebook, and one night a lady posted this picture. And this is from a 1913 postcard, and it's the only known picture of the Y at River Falls. And so you can see the depot there, uh, you see the big white building on the left, that was a store. So the next building to your right is the depot. Uh, the next building to the right, we believe, is a little office or some, something. But this is the only known picture of the White River Falls. The depot sits approximately where the fire department is today up there. So if you go up River Falls Road, get to Gap Creek Road, where the fire department is, that's where the depot was. And so the Y came out towards uh, Gap Creek Road just a little bit. GNK also had to buy their own rolling stock. And with the president and the officers being in Atlanta, one of their main companies that they would buy from was the Georgia Car and Locomotive Company, both rolling stock and locomotives. This is the only known picture of a GNK marked rolling stock, either flat cars, box cars, passenger cars, anything. And one more thing about this railroad, about any of the railroads we talk about tonight, they never owned a caboose. Never ever owned a caboose. Um, remember I was talking about Atlanta and the businessman. Uh, Mr. Patterson was good friends with Asa Candler. Who knows what Asa Candler is famous for? Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. He was the founder of Coca-Cola. And so his friend uh, Asa Candler um, was an early investor in the railroad. And if you notice, him and his associates brought out $20 million worth of bonds to help invest in the railroad. But that was all for naught. Because in 1914, the GNK went broke, went bankrupt. 
And like a lot of railroads at the time, they would go into bankruptcy to save themselves and then would later reform as a different railroad. That's what happened here. They reformed as the Greenville Western Railroad. Um, the two main revenue streams on the line uh, were lumber and rock and sand from, from Wings Quarry near Travel Dress. It's up here where the dump is now. Um, so those were two main revenue streams. This is on the back leg of the Y at River Falls. Um, a lot of a long time we didn't know where that was until we finally saw the, the waterfall in the background. So that's the River Falls. Again, you see the hand hewn ties back there, probably brought in. Uh, there was also a sawmill up there at the end of the line at one point that uh, cut the ties. Um, one of the big draws to that area was the uh, Drake's Hotel and the Caesar's Head Hotel. Um, this is an ad advertising uh, service from the hotel to the depot there at River Falls where they would come down and pick passengers up. <coughs> and then on November 24th, 1916, disaster struck on the Greenwood Western. Um, this, this derailment happened right down here where Edwards Creek is. If you, if you go down Old Bunker Road, you cross over the creek down here. There was a tall bridge at one point down there on the railroad and like I said, the, the right of way was not well kept. And so the train had, had recently stopped at Altamont, which is behind um, uh, Reedy River Baptist Church. There was a little stop there. And they had just stopped there and they were heading towards Traveler's Rest. Now, the speed limit on the line due to the track conditions was about 10 miles an hour. So they weren't going, they shouldn't have been going really fast. But according to the ICC derailment report, the train was traveling at a blistering 20 miles an hour when it got to the trestle. Now also in the ICC report, it detailed what caused the derailment. Like I said, the tracks were in bad condition, so the rails spread apart. And so the engine made it through and out onto the bridge. The first coach was right behind it and it derailed. And it derailed out onto the bridge. And so once it got onto the bridge, it was, it was kind of leaning over and the coach fell off of the bridge. Um, the bridge is about 30 feet tall, so it fell 30 feet into the creek. And the folks in the car, the only thing that saved the folks in the car was the center section fell into the creek. On both ends, the car was flattened, totally flattened. But the center section where the folks were fell into the creek and saved them. Um, so that's this is just a, just right down here at the foot of the hill. Um, here's here's the Greenville Western timetable showing um, the route of the uh, times going into River Falls. They ran four trains a day, and then an additional train on Sunday. Uh, like I said, in twenty in eight or nineteen fifteen, the GNW did a whole flat map. So here's just a few little spots on the GNW. Um, this is coming through Traveler's Rest. Um, I put in there where the Spring Park is. Spring Park Inn is today. You can see just on the bottom where the where the Buncombe Road comes in, it says uh, platform. So that was the platform that the CKNW built for the Spring Park Inn. Like I said, that's approximately where the gazebo is today. Also in Marietta, they, there was another Y in Marietta that was built later on uh, to for, to turn the trains around once they service the mill at Slater. Um, the, uh, the Y is current, well, where the Y was is currently the front yard of the Ebenezer Lodge in Marietta. Um, and if you go up there today and right, going up Slater Road, right in front of the Ebenezer Lodge, you can still see where the tracks cross the road because the rails are still in the ground. So if you go up there today, also in that vicinity, the, the Cle was the Cleveland Brickyard. You can see it down here on the left. Um, that was that was approximately where Whitefield is in Marietta today. Um, another interesting spot on the GNW was at McCarson Road up up Gap Creek. It was known as Riverview. Um, there was a depot built, a freight depot there. Um, there was a siding, and so the public road. Traveling from left to right here is McCarson Road, and the, the the road coming down from the top would be Gap Creek Road, or excuse me, River Falls Road. And so you see the tall the trestle over here on the side. 
Um, this is the only spot north of Cleveland where you can see remnants that are known, that I know of, of the railroad, physical structures that were on the railroad. And if you travel north on River Falls Road, right before you get to what they call Dead Man's Curve, it's a sharp curve, if you look off to the right in the river, well, the bridge pilings from the railroad are still down there in the river. So if you go up that way, make sure to look off, off to your right, it's right before you get there, and you can still see a, some remnants of the railroad up there. So 1918, what's going on in the world? World War I. In um, and, and Greenville, we had, uh, we had Camp Severe, and soldiers from Camp Severe worked at Wings Quarry just north of Traveler's Rest and learned how to destroy and reconstruct railroads on the spur that went into the uh, quarry there, a skill that they would need while fighting in Europe. So 1919, GNW goes bankrupt. And reforms in 1920 as the Greenville Northern Railway. Um, it was owned, the GNN was owned by the Saluda Land and Lumber Company, an affiliate of Baker, Fentress, and Company of Chicago. Um, around 1921, the GNN discontinued passenger service, regular passenger service online. They would occasionally run a special um, up the River Falls, but even that was done by 1925. So after 1921, there was no regular passenger service on the GNN. But they still offered freight and express service for folks that wanted to ship packages up and down the line. Um, just a few numbers on the carloads um, from the GNN in 1927, 2,938 loads of stone from Wings Quarry, 383 of sand from Marietta Sand, which was approximately where Beechwood Farms is now. Um, 320 loads of forest products, 167 loads of brick from the Cleveland Brickyard, 173 loads of cement, 83 of coal, 46 of cotton seed products, which was from the Blue Ridge Cotton Oil Company and TR, and one load of bathtubs. <laughs> I, I got a I got a tracker uh, a tracker report from from Craig over here, and that was at the very bottom. And I was like, if I include nothing else in this, that's going to be on there. Just because it was so out of place, one load of bathtubs, like that would have made a difference. Um, so next, I want to talk about some of the locomotives that were ran on the GNN. Uh, this is locomotive number five. Uh, it was built in 1902 by the Brooks Locomotive Works. It was purchased by the GNN in December of 1927. And this photo was photographed in Greenville, somewhere around uh, Meadowbrook Park, down there around the New Unity Park in 1935. And so one thing about the GNN, there were no heavy locomotive repair facilities. So the railroad would have to ship out its locomotives to either Spencer up in North Carolina along the Southern Railway or to Pegram down in Atlanta. They used the Southern Railway because those were the two closest heavy locomotive repair shops. And so sometimes when they would ship the locomotives out, they'd come back looking different than they were. As evidence here, this is the number five. Um, picture here later in Traveler's Rest, you notice uh, it started out with a headlight on the top, top of the firebox there, and now it's centered in the center of the firebox door. Southern Railway loved to have their headlights low. They also had, had line, they want lines on their locomotives. So you see here, not, not any lines or anything, just a dull locomotive. Here they painted up with great lines, um, very reminiscent of a lot of southern steam locomotives. Um, here's a picture of the five in Traveler's Rest. It, this, uh, this picture showed up on eBay and uh, when we got developed, we didn't notice the background on it. That's, that's Sun, where Sunwreck is now, Blue Ridge Oil Company. But if you look up real close, right above the front plow of the locomotive, there's a poster on the side of the building. Circus. That's for the Barnum and Bailey Brothers Circus. Oh. <laughs> so that kind of gives you an idea of when this picture was taken because later it become Ringling Brothers. I had to include this. Now you can't see it very well, but I, I, I transcribed it just because I want you to, to see this. This was found in the archives of the GNN. 
And this is a, this is a report given to the president of the railroad by an engineer. It's to Mr. F. G. Hamlin, who is the president, general manager. Ford automobile owned by D. E. Barbary of Travelers Rest was parked too near the tracks, just south of Standard Oil Plant in Travelers Rest. Front step of engine five struck the spare tire, bending the tire rack. No other damage done. Could not see the car in time to stop before striking it. Respectfully, D.E. Sheely. I just thought that was, that was just a great piece of, of railroad history there. Striking a car up here in Travel Dress. I'm sure it happened more times than, than we even care to imagine. Um, another locomotive that the GNN owned was the Six. It's an odd looking locomotive. It was a prairie top uh, 262 a wheel arrangement, which is two pilot wheels, three drive, six driving wheels, and two trailing wheels. And it was used mainly on the line from Cleveland to River Falls because there were a lot of tight turns up there. And so with a shorter wheelbase, it could get around those curves a whole lot better. Um, this locomotive was purchased by the GN on May 31st, 1922. Um, like I said, it was used between Cleveland and River Falls. Um, here, it was seen here in this picture. This is not when it worked for the GNN. This was after it was sold uh, to the North Louisiana and Gulf Railroad in October of 1928. I'd love to find the picture of this locomotive with GNN lettering on it, but I have to do with what I, what I can get sometimes. Um, another locomotive that the GNN owned was the 12. It was built by the Brooks Locomotive Company in November of 1899. And it was acquired by the GNN in September of 1931. It was photographed in Greenville, 1937. Um, this, I had never seen a picture of this locomotive until it showed up on Facebook one day. And it wasn't a very clear picture. And so I always wanted a clearer picture of it because it was odd because this is the only locomotive I've ever seen with the name Greenville Northern Railway spelled out on the tender. And so about two weeks ago, this photo showed up on eBay. And I put some crazy number in the bid because I was like, I can't let this picture get away. <laughs> Fortunately, nobody else bid against me, so I got it for cheap. <laughs> but um, that's, like I said, that's the five, or the, uh, the 12. Um, and it's just, like I said, it, it's, you don't see a, another locomotive with the name spelled out. So that's a unique picture there. Next was the 15. This was the workhorse of the GNN. They used this locomotive more and harder than any other locomotive they owned. Um, it was built by the Baldwin Locomotive Company in November of 1920. It was purchased by the GNN, uh, May of 1931, and it was scrapped in 1952. Um, in this picture, as at Helms Crossing, we often thought that that was at Edwards, Edwards Road down here, but the track layout doesn't match down there, so it's, we later found out that it's at Helms Crossing, which is on the old on uh, Wilder's Road Extension, excuse me. And here we see Jake Carroll, Dwight Looper, and Dub Turner posing on the front of the locomotive for a photographer. This is the 15 later at the Terminus in Greenville, June 25th, 1947. Um, I own the original negative of this picture. Um, it's just a great, clear picture of the locomotive. You can see great details on it. Um, like I said, they shipped out the locomotives um, for service and uh, heavy locomotive repair. This is a receipt where they shipped the 15 out um, to Spencer Shops up in uh, Spencer, North Carolina. Um, and it shows that they uh, paid approximately $322.23 to ship it um, at a speed limit of 25 miles an hour from Greenville to Spencer. So that took a little while. Like I said, they, they often came back looking different than they were sent out. As evidence here, 15 had different whistles on it. Um, at some point between 1947 and 1948, the whistles on the 15 changed from the standard three-chime whistle, which was on the left, to a shop-made bowler two whistle um, made from scrap bowler tubes when they replaced them on other locomotives. Um, we have an example of a bowler two whistle over here, um, belongs to Bo Brown. Um, and that was from the Southern Railway, so we believe that one may have been from the Southern Railway after it spent time at Spencer. Um, like I said, it was the 15 was worked harder than a lot of their locomotives. Um, as a short line, they didn't really care about appearance. 
Um, on the Southern Railway, you'd see their big green locomotives traveling up and down the tracks. They were spotless a lot of times. But here, they didn't care about the appearance. They just wanted it to work. And so they didn't spend a lot of time cleaning. Um, this is another picture that I, or another negative that I own is here in Greenville at the terminus down under uh, Academy Street Bridge now, uh, where the Linky Stone Park is. Um, this was in 1948. And when I bought this negative, I bought it because it was a full picture of the locomotive and tender, but I didn't notice one thing. Like I said, they didn't take a whole lot of time to clean off the locomotives. And once I got the picture developed and zoomed in on it, <coughs> apparently somewhere up the line they had struck a tree. <laughs> and so, like I said, they didn't care much as long as it as long as it worked. So they left the tree limb hanging on there for who knows how long. Um, here's the 15. This is a rare color picture of the 15. Um, so you can see the, the gold uh, gold outlines there, the white wheels on the tires, very southern-esque, southern railway-esque. So we believe that Southern did a lot of, a lot of work on these locomotives, uh, dolling them up. Um, probably at the request of the, the GNN guys. Um, at downtown Greenville, they had a turntable. Um, instead of a Y like at River Falls in Marietta, they had a turntable down there. <clears throat> uh, this picture is in Cleveland. This is the only picture of the GNN of a GNN steam locomotive I've ever seen in Cleveland. Um, and again, this is a Facebook find. Um, a friend of mine worked for the Carolina Piedmont, which was one of the later predecessors or uh, successors, and he posted a picture of a sign that he had from the shops. And I texted him. I said, when when you decide to get rid of it, I want that sign. And a lady commented on it. She said, well, my granddaddy worked in the GNN. I said, well, do you have any pictures? And she said, yeah. And so she sent me this picture through Messenger on Facebook. Well, my first response was, can I scan the original? You know, because you don't get good quality through Facebook. And so I scanned it in as high a resolution as I could get. And uh, you can see the 15, like I said, it's going into the band mill at Cleveland. It's got the big bowler two whistle up there. Uh, that's Dub Turner on the fly, on the uh, front uh, pilot there, fixing to throw a switch or had just thrown the switch. At Cleveland, uh, Saluda Land and Lumber Company had built uh, a big band mill in October, not, October 15, 1939. Uh, the mill opened. Um, and in 1941, the line to River Falls is abandoned, making Cleveland the uh, the norm, nor, uh, nor, excuse me, northern terminus of the railroad. Um, in 1942, the band mill was sold to Georgia Pacific Company, and the, the business picked up then. We believe, uh, since that was the northern terminus, that there was a turntable here um, at some point to turn the locomotives to head back south, because they wouldn't have gone backwards for all the way from Cleveland to Marietta's turn. <clears throat> so August 5th, 1948, the GNM buys its first diesel electric locomotive, uh, the number 70. Um, they bought it brand spanking new from GE. Now, a story that I was related, uh, the very first trip the 70 made north uh, through Travers Rest and up towards Marietta, the locomotive broke down. Brand new, brand spanking new locomotive broke on the very first trip. Well, the White Looper and the, and the other guys had to go to a farmhouse, make a call, and uh, they said, hey, fire up the 15, we're coming back, send somebody to pick us up. And so they took the 15 up, finished switching duties, and drove the 70 back to Greenville, where they would work on it. Um, November 9th, 1951, the GNM buys a second 70 ton, these are called, called 70 tonner switchers uh, from GE. This was the 75. Uh, picture here in Travers Rest, you can see uh, Sunrift right behind, uh, well, right between the engine and the coal car there. And also, just uh, behind the locomotive there, that's the top of uh, Tandem. Um, that's, the, that's the roof of Tandem, so it gives you an idea where it is. July 30, 1957, the Greenville Northern is purchased by shortline railroad tycoon Sam Pinsley for $197,000 which relates to $2.05 million today, purchased 98% of the stock. Um, the locomotives were then painted uh, with the standard Pinsley paint scheme with the red and, and black and yellow letters. Um, the nine locomotive here uh, in front, 
So that's the 75, the 70, and then later on they brought the 9 down when they needed more power, and it was painted for the Greenville Northern. Like I said, in 19, by 1921 there was no regular passenger service, no passengers to travel the rails. But in 1959, the GNN has passengers again uh, by way of the Furman Senior Hobo Trips. Uh, these trips ran from 1959 to 1965. What they would do, the seniors from Furman University uh, would load up there at the back gate, load into uh, the passenger cars. This is the 1959 trip. They had two gondola cars supplied by the Southern Railway, uh, two passenger cars, and a caboose. Uh, all supplied by the Southern, so the, the, the students would load, the seniors would load in the gondolas, the passenger cars, and the caboose, and was going to, and we're going to take a trip to the field at Cleveland and have a big picnic. Um, I think it's Tom, t Tom, Tom Drake back here. Tom was on one of the trips. You were 1961, correct? That's right. You were on the 1961 trip. So there, if you have any questions about the hobo trip, see Tom back there. He'll be glad to tell you about 1961. <laughs> Um, so this is the train crossing the high bridge at Beechwood. Um, this is one of the only known pictures that I have of the bridge with a train on it. Um, so you can see the two gondolas, the two passenger cars, and the caboose. So when they were heading north, they got to Hart's Cut. Well, that proved to be a problem. Because the passenger car, the two full passenger cars, were too long to get through the cut and the, the cars were going to scrape on the side so they decided to take a picture at, under the bridge their hearts cut and then they would back down to uh, J.P. Stevens the Slater Mill where they would have a picnic and dancing and all sorts of games and stuff so this is this is this is an early picture under hearts cut um, one of the only ones I've ever seen of trains under hearts cut um, so this is the old bridge and so that's 1959, and that's what Hart's Cut looks like today from the same exact angle. So when you go up Hart Cut Road to Marietta and cross over the bridge, that was where the railroad cut was. So that's what it looks like today. So from that to that. Um, so like I said, they backed down to Slater Mill, um, where the railroad served Slater, Slater Mill. Um, they, they did... Uh, cotton processing, uh, fabric processing. They also produced some of the fabric used in the spacesuits um, on the Apollo missions. <clears throat> so 1961 comes along and the band mill in Cleveland closes down. Um, the railroad no longer has any reason to run north of Marietta. So on September 27, 1963, the GNN officially requests the ICC to abandon the line from Marietta, just north of uh, the Pulpwood Yard in Marietta, uh, north to Cleveland. And in steps Harry Stewart, which is from Ghost Town, Melvin Gerard, Martin Baker, the Lawton Brothers, and Hayward Ballard of Ballard Concrete and others. Uh, and they formed Echo Valley Theme Park. Now I'm not gonna talk about Echo Valley tonight because that's another presentation for another day. But I do want to clear up some misconceptions about this locomotive, the 110. You see it on a lot of advertisements in Travel Dress. It's used on a lot of things. But this engine, despite what some people say and some people think they understand, this engine was never an engine that was used on the Greenville Northern Railway. In fact, we only have record of it running under steam twice while on Greenville Northern trackage. Like I said, the railroad, you had to have documentation for everything. So that was a beautiful thing because we have documentation that tells us exactly what happened and exactly how it was used. So we have the documentation that shows this locomotive was only ran under steam twice on the GN. The first time uh, was on June 25th, 1966, when they ran the engine down to Greenville with the Echo Valley coaches and some of the folks from the park uh, to pick up a load of kids from Miracle Hill um, to take them up to Echo Valley for a day camp. And then the, the second time, the last time that it was under steam on the GNN was after the park had closed in 1968. Uh, Stone Mountain Park in Georgia purchased the locomotive. And so they ran it under steam out of Echo Valley and down to Greenville to be shipped out. 
Um, there's a lot of talk about who was running the locomotives. Um, another thing about railroads is they're not going to let just anybody run a locomotive over their territory. So anytime this engine was on Greenville Northern Rails, it was under the care of, uh, uh, oh shoot, I can't think of his name now. Anybody that worked for the railroad, let's just say anybody that worked for the railroad. So it had to be one of those guys. <clears throat> So this locomotive started out at Cliffside North Cliffside Railroad. Um, again, it was 262, it was built in 1923 by Vulcan Locomotive Works. I mean, made its last run at, at Cliffside, um, July 20th, 1962, and then it was sold to Echo Valley. Um, there's a lot of talk about how it got to Echo Valley. Again, we have documentation. This is the way bill for the shipping of the railroad, of, of the steam locomotive. It also shows the routing from, uh, you can see it went from Cliffside, North Carolina, along the Seaboard Airline, the SAL, to, uh, to Shelby, where it hopped on the Southern and was towed to Greenville by the Southern Railway, where it was picked up in Greenville down at the Southern Railway Yard and towed to Echo Valley. Um, it was not under steam when it was brought to Echo Valley. It was towed by the GNN for a grand total of $399.23. <coughs> Um, and, and you notice there under the description, um, just documentation, use steam locomotive moving on own wheels, but not under own power. So it wasn't running when it ran to Echo Valley, it was being towed. Uh, this is a picture of the locomotive sitting in the Greenville Yard when it was delivered. Uh, a friend of mine named Tom Watkins' dad took this picture. Um, you can see it lettered there um, in the background. Uh, you can see the crew office that was in Greenville along with the Greenville Derrick, or the crane that they used in Greenville. Um, so when it was delivered, it looked like that. When it got to Echo Valley, it looked like that. <laughs> Painted up and, and, and all cartoony, and, and it, was really, it was a really cool locomotive, I'm sure. I'd love to find a video of it running to Echo Valley. So if you have any videos, come see me afterwards. Um, <clears throat> so, like I said, 1968, the park closed. Um, the GNN abandoned uh, north of Trowel's Rest because at that point uh, Slater Mill was, was no longer receiving shipments by rail so they, they tore up the tracks from just north of Trowel's Rest to Marietta around 1970. So for the next part of this, this, this presentation, last part of it, we're going to take a little trip up the GNN. We're going to chase the train up the GNN. This is the office building in downtown Greenville. So we're going to start here. Here we find our locomotive sitting at the at the uh, locomotive shops in Greenville. Um, you see the the Academy, or, yeah the Academy Street Bridge there in the background, downtown buildings. Next we catch the train at Hudson Street. Now at this point it's running on the old CKNW, which was then owned by the Seaboard Airline or Seaboard Coast Line, but since it was parallel, they could travel um, on the parallel tracks just to uh, just to uh, get to where they need to go. And this is that exact exact same shop today. Um, this is down there around A.J. Wittenberg Academy and uh, the Croc Center and uh, Linky Stone Park. Um, I'm thankful to have friends that took pictures. Uh, this next picture is from one of those friends. Uh, this is near Hudson Street. He was riding with the crew that day. They're switching out cars. They would interchange cars with the Seaboard Coast Line. Um, on the far side of the river, well, on this side of the river. Um, on the far side over there is the, the uh, old Charleston, Western Carolina. And so on this side of the river, you had the GNN and then you had the PNN, Piedmont Northern, line into downtown Greenville. Well, when the Seaboard Coastline bought out the PNN, they closed the depot in downtown Greenville. And so they used the old trackage right there as the interchange yard. So this is them switching out uh, scrap guns there. Um, in the old yard. Moving north, we find the we find the train crossing Willard Street, um, just under the Southern Railway main line. It runs from Atlanta to Charlotte. Um, and one thing about this picture, uh, a lot of time, most of the time at the crossings, they would they would have to get somebody would have to get off the locomotive and flag the crossing to stop the cars, since there were no lights and bars and stuff like that. They would get off the locomotive and flag the crossings. And so that's that same location today. Well, in 2013, I mean, or 2010, excuse me. 
Um, shows the difference, shows the trail there now. Um, continue moving north, we're approaching Bram Road here uh, with some GNM boxcars and gondolas uh, heading for the, the uh, industrial park in Berea. And once they had to cross, once they got to what they call River Junction at Bramlett Road, they had to cross the old Piedmont Northern line. Uh, that line ran from Greenwood to Spartanburg. So there they had to cross it at a diamond. Well, they had to get permission to cross the diamond from the dispatcher, which is the office is just behind just behind the photographer here in this picture. Um, so they also had a, a what they called a, a crash bar there uh, to protect the to protect the diamond. Um, and so once they got permission, they could move that crash bar and proceed through the diamond. And there's looking back towards Spartanburg, shows the dispatcher office, um, the old uh, P&N dispatcher office, um, which my great uncle worked as the dispatcher in that office. Um, so they're waiting here to, uh, to get permission to cross. And that's what it looks like today. Um, you can actually see in this, well, excuse me, 2010, I keep calling it today. Um, in 2010, you can see the diamond sitting over there laying in the bushes um, after they removed it. So continuing north, we'll catch the train here uh, at the interchange track uh, with the Southern Railway behind Monaghan Mill. Now, the Southern Railway had permission to use this track to interchange cars because there was a small yard, I believe, right, Marvin, over uh, just, just north of this picture. Uh, yeah, and so uh, the Southern Railway had permission to run in here, and the GNN also used this to get over to the Southern Railway yard um, to pick up cars. Um, and so th in 2015, that's what this spot looked like. So you go from that to that. Um, so we're going to chase the train into, into the Greenville yard, just a little bit, Southern Railway yard. The GNN would literally cross itself at the Diamond to run over the interchange with the Southern. Uh, there's also a small interchange yard, like I said, uh, just north of uh, these pictures. Um, here it is. Here's the train crossing itself with Monaghan Mill in the background. Uh, it had to cross again, cross the PNN uh, main line again here. And then it ran up, the, it ran into a tail track uh, near Cedar, Cedar Lane Road. And then it had to run up the hill into the Greenville Yard where they could drop off uh, cars and pick up others. Um, this is just great. I love this picture because it still has the Hoe Mill in the background and Paris Mountain. So keep on going north here. We're at Cedar Lane Road. Uh, today, the Swamp Rabbit Grocery is just out of frame to the left. And here we are, Blue Ridge Drive, um, where they're putting in a stop sign or stop lights now for the trail people, trail folks to safely cross. Uh, the lead in the uh, spur track into Union Bleacher is just out of the frame to the to the right. And here we come to the, one of the main concentration of customers on the GNN, uh, the Maria Industrial Park. This this area was heavily promoted by Mr. Pinsley um, to provide customers for the railroad. And if you go over there today, um, the road through there is actually called Pinsley Circle. Um, so here we see the train entering uh, the Berea Industrial Park. Uh, one of the largest customers in the industrial park was a scrapyard. Um, so here they would they would uh, pick up scrap guns, and uh, also note uh, the company, the IMP, owned their own switcher to use if need be. And uh, if you notice, kind of behind the switcher on the left, you'll see a, you'll see what looks like a passenger car. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. And so here's just a great picture in, in the plant there, uh, in the scrap yard. Um, you see them loading the scrap cars with the cranes. Um, I've been told that this place was a muddy mess all the time. And, and they just hated getting down in the scrap yard just because it was, it was an awful mess. Another customer um, at the scrap yard was Groom and Associates. Um, I'm not real sure what they shipped out, but they received box marble, you can probably paper. paper products. Okay, thank you. Um, so they, they had box cars that they would pick up there. Um, another company there at the, at, the, uh, at the industrial park was HT Hackney Foods and Food Service Products. Um, they shipped out frozen foods and other things uh, in refrigerated box cars. And so they would, they would 
freeze the freeze the products, put them in these box cars, and ship them out all over the country. So the passenger car that you saw in the background there is this car, yeah. um, the old Southern Railway steam generator car. They would use this car on Southern Railway passenger trains uh, to provide steam heat to the radiators in the other passenger cars. They would have they would have pipes that would run between the cars, and that's how they provided heat in the cars. Uh, this this uh, car served on the CNO and TP division, Cincinnati, New Orleans, to Texas Pacific. They ran from Cincinnati to New Orleans. Um, it was also known as the Rat Hole because of all the the, uh, the tunnels on the line. And so this, like I said, I love to find pictures of stuff when it was in service. This is that car when it was in service on the Southern Railway. And then now. We come to the awful color that it is painted. <laughs> I, I, like I said, I'm a purist, so I would love to see it back in the original paint, not in this ugly, my mother would call it monkey vomit green <laughs> uh, color. So I, I'd, love to, I'd love to work on a project restoring it, but that's, that's beyond me. Uh, so north of, Blue, uh, north of Sulphur Springs Road, you run through a pretty desolate country. <laughs> until you come to what on the railroad was called Montague. Um, this is at Duncan Chapel Road. Here's the train coming north uh, with, some, with some hopper cars. Uh, one unique picture I have in my collection. Um, here, a passenger car that was owned, a private passenger car that was owned by a Furman University professor. Uh, they contracted with the GNN uh, to have their private car delivered to Furman for graduation week. And so the family stayed in the car during graduation week, um, him and his daughters and, and, and wife and other kids. Um, also here at Montague is this car. This is one of my favorite cars that still survives of the Southern. Um, it was built in, in uh, 1925 by the Pullman Company. It was originally built as an observation car. Um, and in 1954, the Southern Railway did a big... Uh, rehab a lot of their passenger cars and it was done over here at Hain Car Shop in Spartanburg where Bo's granddaddy worked. Um, and so when I say observation car, this is what it looked like originally. Um, I, that's the Southern Railway observation car. I don't know that that's the one there, but I'd like to think so. Um, so Southern Railway donated that car after, after they got done with it, donated it to the Boy Scouts. Um, Boy Scout Troop uh, 282. Um, they would hold their meetings there in the car. This spot also holds a very special place in my heart um, because uh, later on, uh, the Scott Company, was, they would store tanker cars here. And a beautiful thing about short line railroads is they don't necessarily care as much about you know, people looking at stuff and, and walking across their railroad tracks. And so when they stored those tanker cars there, that was my playground. <laughs> That's a picture of me climbing all over those tank cars that were stored there. I don't know what was in them, um, but probably better than I don't know. Um, so the siding and the tanker cars were my playground. Um, so I have a deep, long time connection with the GNN. Uh, so this is what it looks like today. Um, we're at the trail. And unfortunately, the trees, they've planted a bunch of trees around the passenger car, so you can't see it anymore. Um, but anyway, it's, it's right behind, well, you can see the top of it, right there on the right side of the picture. Uh, so moving north, another one of my favorite pictures, uh, passing the uh, Doughboy statue, the back gate of Furman. Um, it's just a, just a great picture, uh, great composition. Uh, continuing north, uh, we pass where the Woodlands is today, and this is Row Ford Road, and we're approaching the Zonalite plant. Uh, Zonalite uh, did fertilizer, vermiculite, and other products. Um, so this is the train entering the plant at Zonalite, uh, taken from the uh, Highway 25 bridge there, White Horse Road. This is what it looks like today. Uh, plants gone, track is grown, uh, but the trail's there, so it preserved the right of way. Uh, this is another picture of Zonalite. Um, that's uh, Jake Stowe, Dwight Looper, Charlie Collins, and Dub Turner. 
uh, picture with the locomotive entering the plant. And also at, at this location was paper cutters. Um, this is a later picture with the GP9 uh, that they later brought, brought in uh, as they needed bigger power uh, to pull the trains. Uh, the next picture is, uh, I, I had to include this picture just because of where it's at. This is crossing right down here at Edwards Road, uh, the museum. Uh, the History Museum is just out of frame to your left. Um, you can see the, uh, the interchange there. Um, just down the tracks, a little piece is where Edwards Creek and the Edwards Bridge derailment occurred. Um, next, we're coming up to the uh, probably the most busy part of the railroad. Traveling through the, traveling through the, uh, the uh, shopping mall there. So this is obviously before the, the road was widened, Main Street was widened, because you had parking on both sides of the tracks here, which didn't present a very big problem for the railroad until the, they decided they wanted to widen Main Street. So you can just see out of the frame to the right, or just on the right side of the frame, some construction barriers starting to work on widening Main Street. Well, that took away the parking on that side of the tracks. So what do people do? Instead of parking in the, in the parking lot, finding somewhere else to park and walking, they kind of try to cram in there. Yeah. Some days the train would come through and it looked like this, nobody there. But then other days they come through and it was like, it was, it was, a, it was a mess. It was like Atlanta at 4.30 on Friday afternoon. Um, and what they'd have to do is they'd have to stop and blow the horn and people come running out of the shops and move their cars. And, <laughs> I think in this picture they had to move a, uh, a, a uh, advertising banner too. So that was a lot of fun right there for the railroad personnel. Um, one thing about short line railroading, you had to be able to do everything. So one day you could be running the train, next day you could be running the backhoe. Uh, that's Dwight Looper changing out some ties um, right there on Main Street. That house is still there. Um, so this picture was probably taken there in the shopping center. And like I said, that's Dwight changing out some, some ties there. Uh, next, next, we'd catch the train at another scenic spot uh, near and dear to the uh, Historical Society of Spring Park. Um, you can see the uh, original road where it came across. That's kind of where it goes today. And then also the original road kept going down and you could get on Main Street that way. And like I said, the, uh, the platform we believe was just out of frame where the platform would have been is just out of frame here. Uh, here we catch the train crossing where the, uh, the driving range is. That's coming through the parking lot, the driving range now. And next we'll catch the train at one of my favorite spots. Um, this was a favorite spot, Jim Shepherd's, to take pictures. Those cabooses uh, were, were originally purchased for Echo Valley uh, from the Lawton brothers. And what they would do is they would take those cars and convert them into open passenger cars. And evidently those two just didn't make, make the cut. And they parked them there and just left them there. And they stayed there for years and years and years. Um, at one point there was a fellow that tried to restore uh, one of them to sell for a private residence. Um, as you can see, it had a paint job on it and they were working on it. But, uh, Jim Shepard also loved this spot because he could climb on top of the cabooses and take pictures. Um, this is, like I said, this is one of his favorite spots to take pictures. Um, unfortunately, as time and weather dragged on, the cabooses rotted and, uh, and were eventually scrapped there at that location. Um, next up, we're crossing Main Street. Um, North Main Street tandem is just out of the frame to the right. You can see Sunrift over here. Um, and that's what it looks like today. Same spot today. Um, and this spot also was, was the yard for the GNN. Uh, the GNN in the early 80s bought some boxcars and gondolas to use for their fleet. They would store a lot of them here um, until they're ready to use. Uh, the next is a, is a famous photo. A lot of folks have seen this picture. Uh, this is servicing the yard there at uh, Traveler's Rest. Um, you have uh, Thacker's Texaco in the background and the red diamond there with the gas prices that I wish were still, still true, but unfortunately things change. 
Um, also at this location, there was a coal entire uh, coal dump uh, where they would back the coal car up on the uh, up on the dump there, open the bottom uh, doors, and the coal would dump out, and people could come and buy it. Um, they also, I think, they dumped stone there too, maybe or sand. Um, and then also in the yard there at Traveler's Rest was a fellow that uh, worked on restoring passenger cars. Um, this you can see the ice house there in the background. Um, one, at one point, there was a famous car in the yard at Traveler's Rest. This car belonged to Jackie Gleason, the, the uh, famous actor Jackie Gleason. Uh, he was afraid to fly, so he bought a few rail cars, and everywhere he wanted to go, he would go by rail. And so that's one of his rail cars sitting here in Traveler's Rest uh, getting worked on. Continuing north, we catch the train at a, at a picture that cannot be recreated today. Um, this is just across from the high school, and both of the houses in this picture are no longer there. Uh, the house on the left burned down, and then the house there on top of the hill was, was torn down um, later on. And that's what it looks like today. Uh, continuing north, here we're passing the cemetery, catch the train at the cemetery uh, with uh, one of the guys there um, getting ready to flag a crossing. And again at the cemetery. Coming up on Renfrew, uh, Renfrew Bleachery. Um, they, would, they would receive uh, shipments by boxcar. They also receive coal there for the uh, power plant. Um, so that's the coal cars there um, on the back. And they would shove those back into the power plant and dump the coal out uh, to power the power plant. Uh, just north of Renfrew, uh, later on, another company was formed, Air Products. Um, they, uh, this is in June of 1996, uh, the train working air products. They, were, uh, they produced polyvinyl alcohol blend, which was used in the textile industry as a sizing product. Um, my friend Richard Helderman took this picture. Um, so I wanted to include it uh, in honor of him. Uh, just north of air products, um, the last customer on the line, post-1970, was Guy and Beatty, they received shipments of insulation, um, but they were stopped, they stopped receiving shipments in 1981. So Air Products later on was the last customer on the line. And so next is probably the saddest picture um, in, in the slideshow tonight. This is the conductor train report, uh, April 25th, 1997. This is the last train on the last day of the Greenville Northern Railway. At midnight, the GNN was no more. Uh, the two tanker cars that you see there um, were dropped at the Scotts fertilizer plant at the old, old Zonalite. And the four box cars uh, that were dropped at Graham Industries in Berea uh, would be picked up by a different company on Monday. Monday, April 28, 1997, the Carolina Piedmont begins operating, operating over the GNN as the Swamp Rabbit route uh, after purchasing the line and its assets for $400,000. Uh, the Carolina Piedmont operates over the line until January of 1998 and then halts operations never to be restarted when a pair of bridges near downtown Greenville were condemned. Much of the line lay in, in great need of repair. That's uh, looking uh, from Duncan Chapel Road toward uh, Watkins Bridge Road. You can see the, the tracks in, in just terrible shape. June of 1999, Greenville County forms the Greenville County Economic Development Corporation and buys the line from Greenville to just beyond Traveler's Rest, which comes out to 11.8 miles for $1.3 million with the intention of removing the railroad for, the, for a potential project. In the meantime, customers and other interested parties take their case to the Surface Transportation Board and to the courts in an effort to keep the railroad operating and servicing customers. There were some folks that had money in hand ready to buy the railroad, but their motions and efforts were denied. And in 2007, the rails and ties were removed to make, make way for the project, uh, the Swamp Rabbit Trail. Uh, here's, here's where they pulled up the rails at, at uh, Air Products. Uh, one, one great thing, I'll tell you a real quick story about this. 
Uh, a friend of mine had a business in the old air products building and when they pulled up the rails they kept the fence up around air products and so they couldn't get in there to get a lot of this a lot of the track materials out the ties and the and spikes and stuff so i called my buddy i said hey can i come up and walk through the yard he said sure and so like Bo said i, I love collecting junk so i went up there with a couple of five gallon buckets and i left with a couple of five gallon buckets full of spikes and tie plates and <laughs> other stuff i have a whole old tool truck toolbox full of spikes and tie plates at my house <laughs> Um, and this, this is them down uh, at Cedar Lane Road, Swamp Rabbit Groceries, uh, just out of, just down the hill to your left. And here we are at, at uh, uh, Blue Ridge Drive, <coughs> yeah, um, with the ties, they just pulled the tie, the rails up, uh, and the ties would come up next. Um, so for my last, last picture in here, this is one of the, the uh, the lamppost plaques that the Historical Society sold. Um, as far as I know, Tom, maybe you can elaborate on this. I think Jim Shepard bought the very first. He bought the very first. Yeah, bought the very first uh, uh, plaque for the light for the lampposts. Uh, he wanted to do it in honor of the GNN. Um, and uh, so, in closing tonight, uh, I want to dedicate this program. Uh, to the many employees that kept our little mountain railroad short line, short line railroad running from 1888 to 1997 against all odds. Um, it's also dedicated to the memory of Jim Shepard, uh, who I used a lot of his pictures in this slideshow, um, who loved the GNN and did an incredible job documenting the railroad. I also want to dedicate to the memory of Richard Helderman, uh, who also used uh, some of his pictures tonight. And so I appreciate you coming tonight. If anybody has any questions, I'll I'll try to answer them at this time, and if not, we'll Thank you. Do you have a website with some of those pictures? Uh, no, sir, I don't. Um, a lot of the pictures are um, owned by other people, um, so I just have them from my research, and so it would be pretty impossible to get permission from a lot of the folks uh, to put them on a website. But if you go on Facebook or just a Google search, and then Greenville Northern Railway, you can find a lot of these pictures. Yeah, so like I said, this is 15 years of research. Um, it took all that time to find a lot of these pictures. So, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I missed a word that you said engine number six was made short or something to go around the curve. Yes, ma'am, it, it was the, the wheelbase on it was a, short, was a shorter wheelbase. Wheelbase. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Could you tell who owned the cabooses? Uh, the, Lal the Lalton brothers owned the cabooses. They had a they had a lumber company off of Washington uh, Avenue, mm -hmm. and they had probably about thirty or forty cabooses over there that they would strip down and use for lumber. And they sold, like I said, they sold a lot of them to Echo Valley and were used for the coaches up there. Yes, sir. With the early we had were showing piles of railroad signs. Mm -hmm. Were they treated? Uh, no, sir, those were not treated ties. And like I said, they, they proved to be a problem for the railroad because they rotted quicker. So, anybody else? If not, remind people to come up and look at all yeah, of your Yeah, yeah, and, and again, if you have any more questions, I'll be I'll be here um, as long as as long as y'all want to talk. Um, as soon as we adjourn, y'all can come up here. I brought some artifacts. I um, also want to thank Bo Brown, uh, Craig Myers, and Marvin McCarson. Uh, for loaning me some things to put on display here tonight. Um, all the stuff you see here are from my collection and their collections. Um, so, all right, do you want to adjourn us? Thank you very much. Is there a motion that we adjourn? All right, you're dismissed. Yes. <laughs>